So this is the third time I've been here for one of these sessions, and Judy was just giving me some of the history of the programs that we're patching a partnership that Harvard has enjoyed in, um, in helping to, I think, instigate and, and uh, grow this really kind of important program. So now that I know a lot more about where it is that I've been speaking, I'm a little bit more nervous and probably should be. <laughs> I know that all of you have, a, a, have a sort of different levels of experience and expertise in the range of topics that sort of can be discussed in this, in this kind of field of research compliance, oversight, research administration. And then I'm also nervous because I recognize some faces in the audience, so that if I'm puffing myself up or claiming to do things that I actually haven't done, there are actually some credibility um, uh, checks here in the audience that I'm looking at right now. So, um, so I'll try to keep it realistic in terms of my own experience and how it might relate to you, which I think is really significant. So um, many of you may not fully be aware of what somebody who manages government relations and communications um, does on a daily basis and how that might interact with what you do. But in most of the large research universities in particular, um, there are significant and growing areas of government relations because of the, um, basically in the last 20 years, the increasing interactions with the, with the federal government. And it is, you know, truly a partnership with the federal government. You can't untangle the financial relationships that we have now, whether it's in student financial aid, whether it's in our endowments and, and management of charitable tax issues, or whether it's in research administration because of the significant amount of funding that we get. So the responsibilities are really great, and the attention on the side of how we husband resources from the federal government in all those areas has never been more intense, and it's just growing. So I think the need for professionalism and a workforce in those fields is a growth area in at university. There's no question about that. Um, my own experience, um, as you heard, I've been at Harvard for a long time, and I started at Harvard doing mostly state relations because I had an experience there. And my, my one of my first ventures um, in representing Harvard in Congress was shortly after I got there. Um, something that many of you have heard about in the past probably was the investigations that then Chairman John Dingell had um, with Stanford University on indirect costs and. It was a period of a much looser relationship on accounting methodologies in terms of the administration of grants and understanding of, um, of kind of the uh, financial underpinnings of, of defending how we're getting the funds. But the Dingle investigations, you know, people still kind of cringe when they think about them because they basically resulted in a president leaving Stanford University. Um, it was um, a complete kind of meltdown of the relationship between the, the Congress and universities on, on husbanding of, of funds. And it was, you know, kind of fortunate for Harvard at the time um, because the investigators of the committee had focused on some kind of glaring issues with Stanford, and they were then going to direct their attention to Harvard, but it provided us a little bit of time to get ourselves prepared for how we would interact with the committee while they were focused on Stanford. So. Um, what we did was we sort of hired some outside auditing firms at the time to sort of do scrub of our books. But again, the accounting methods, the circulars governing and current costs were much looser than they are today, and they were refined because of uh, that investigation and other refinements that occurred afterwards. And I think they actually serve us well now in defending how we handle money because, you know, at the time, and, and I am not an expert on all this stuff. I know more than a lot of my government relations colleagues. I've just been around for a long time and done a few some of these things. But Ed Markey, at the time of this investigation, was on the committee. He was a senior member of the big committee. I just know of his staff. And so I became so involved in this discussion because often those connections appropriately become helpful. There's nothing wrong with them. It's just uh, sort of informational sharing. But, um, but this was a, a, an introduction for me into the importance of understanding how the money is handled on campus, how attention can be, how the, thought, the spotlight can be focused on these things in very troubling ways in universities, and how that kind of memory of people can last a long time. People still talk about those type of investigations on the Nova staff and others remember them. They may not be fully aware of some of the um, uh, modifications that have occurred that have strengthened these ties. Then you sort of flash forward to um, 
to about a decade or more ago with the Jesse Belsinger case at the University of Pennsylvania, where a gene therapy trial kind of um, uh, it resulted in the death of sort of a healthy young man in the field, and some conflicts of interest were revealed um, that cast a, another kind of light on relationships between industry, universities, um, royalties, and other kinds of things. And so another area emerged that um, it was really important for us to get a handle on and for us to build credibility with those who, who um, provide the funding, those who watch the funders of the conference. So there's always kind of a, a, a circle of interest in this. You have the agencies who we all pre prefer to deal with on these issues because they tend to be much more scientifically knowledgeable. They have real science professionals involved in the folks that you all interact with or will interact with on a daily basis. But then they know they have Congress looking over the issue. So typically you'll have NIH coming down hard when the heat gets raised on them because Congress is conducting hearings, um, dragging them in from Bethesda um, before the spotlights, sending letters demanding uh, them to produce paperwork on relationships with universities or with industry, and then therefore they put the squeeze on the university because they're trying to demonstrate that they're being responsive as well. So it's a very um, tricky kind of business that you get involved in. Um, increasingly, um, focus has been uh, raised on international relationships. So now many of the uh, larger schools around the world are, around the country are involved, engaged in, in world issues. There uh, schools of public health are uh, administering programs, um, uh, aligning patients, working and administrating, in, administering therapies in some cases, and therefore the whole issue of informed consent, what it means not only with certain populations in the U.S., but what it means in different countries who have different kinds of national standards. What, what, do that, what does that mean in terms of administration? And I would say that most large research institutions have had issues in every one of those areas. Conflict of interest, indirect cost, um, <coughs> international uh, informed consent, or even just informed consent as it relates to emerging fields like stem cell research and others. So um, current practices, um, as they emerge and still come into play when Congress begins to adopt new guidelines for new therapies or new areas of research like stem cell research. So, uh, so what you're doing today may change, uh, standards may change in a few years, but that paperwork and those, um, those um, consents that you may have today will apply down the street when those kinds of uh, policies are, are being revised in Congress because of possible areas of research that come on. So the whole idea for government relations people who typically spend most of our time working to generate new funds in government, right? So um, a large portion of the time that people who work in our office is devoted to talking about the great science, letting the, um, uh, the press and the uh, members of Congress know of the great work we're doing with the funds that we're getting. And, um, and typically, in a bipartisan fashion, there's strong support for that. The question typically is, um, how much can we possibly provide for particularly biomedical research, which most members of Congress really care about because almost in the house they have parents who they're dealing with with the scissors, spouse that has problems, or children. But in the Senate, you have an older cohort who are themselves experiencing a lot of these issues. So there's broad support for these kinds of um, areas of research. But that support can be derailed quickly, and attention can be diverted um, against our interests with problems in these kinds of areas. So the compliance piece, the oversight, the pre-grant, post-grant management is really critical. And um, it came to light for me uh, of the emerging importance of it during the stimulus discussion uh, on, on uh, whether or not research funding would be included in the stimulus bill. And we worked in Harvard and some other large institutions around the country worked really hard when we realized that the stimulus bill that was emerging in 2008 was getting to be almost a trillion dollars in size. Um, we put a tremendous amount of effort to get research funding in Cuba again because if you, if a piece of legislation of that size, which is almost the size of the entire federal government's a single year budget is going to be produced and it didn't include university-based research, then you're 
relevance has to be questioned. Um, so we made strong arguments and we worked really hard to convince um, thought leaders in Washington and Congress to include a significant amount of research because we argued that that would be about innovation um, going forward, that they would be, you know, as they were repairing the bridges and the infrastructure and the grid and other things, supposedly the stimulus bill was a gap, uh, that they could at once um, create the new technologies that would be carried on all these new, this new infrastructure that they were building. And they bought that argument and they put a significant amount of research and the largest infusion of research dollars in any single goal um, um, in since post World War II, as far as I can tell. And so there was $23 million in good research money of all kinds, and in particular, $10 million in NIH, and uh, I think three and a half million dollars in the National Science Foundation. And that's critical to where we're sitting right now, because as we told Governor Patrick, and as he told his friend Obama, it, especially NIH funding was critical to the country, but he gave the back of the what he told them, which was one in every $10 comes to Massachusetts. So we had done the math. And he said, for every billion, if we can get $10 million in NIH funding, a billion is going to come to Massachusetts. And he actually did better than that. And so there was a significant infusion of money. And then we knew that the watchdogs were going to really be out on this stuff. So that's when we started to have a lot of meetings at Harvard, and I know what's happening at MIT and elsewhere at BU, about how, how do we administer this? Because we know in this platform that we're finding where everyone is now Trump talking about the stimulus bill as government waste, the worst thing that can happen to us is for people to find examples where we wasted the money, where we got even silly kind of grants, they can only be silly sounding grants, even if the science is fantastic. And so a number of us worked really hard at Harvard. You know that people were being hired for um, to help us with the compliance and oversight, not simply because of the new and really daunting kind of um, uh, requirements that were imposed, you know, the quarterly reports, and now I have to figure out a way to report on jobs. And I know that some of you have wrestled with the ever-changing definitions over that time of what, how you could count the number of jobs. But this became a really important thing for us to follow. I literally read the titles of over 800 grant applications at Harvard just because I was worried that some silly-sounding grant application would go viral and be on Fox News Network and, you know, they'd be all over Harvard for this kind of thing. And it's kind of interesting because, in fact, there were a number of um, inquiries about grants and a couple of instances we sort of lucked out that the grant didn't really come to fruition because one faculty member got tenure actually and couldn't devote the time to the grant, which had a, was really great research but would have been a difficult one in the public arena to defend because its title was something about um, this is the one on the hair salons in Brazil or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And it was about dealing with um, studying the impact of chemicals and other toxins in yeah. the environment, like a beauty salon. <laughs> but but in, in a country stressed for resources, that would have been a different difficult one to defend. But there was another one that we started out that really I lost a lot of sleep over, um, did a lot of work on, and turned into be the one of one of the highest risk ones for us we thought in terms of reputational risk of the grant to one of the ones we now trumpet on the hill as an extremely important expenditure of money. And that was one that was a National Science Foundation grant. And I think it was a $10 million grant. Um, and it had been in the pipeline beforehand. But it was about um, developing robo bees um, that sounded kind of silly the way NSF was actually putting a press release that we actually didn't force, but we actually appealed to NSF to change the press release that they were putting out because all I could see was mechanical bees with like a Harvard sweater <laughs> buzzing around on the Fox News network. And we would have been on, you know, every single kind of um, snarky television commentators. And we did make a couple of them, but eventually what we turned it into was this research is really phenomenally um, cutting edge, multidisciplinary robotics. Um, research that could in, in all kinds of engineering and um, computer sciences and, and computational stuff and with really good defense applications and surveillance applications and, and you know defense is a popular area on the hill for and we kind of turned that into one of the things that we're actually trumpeting now. We actually brought to and in the last trip that we took to Washington with uh, President Faust we actually had a 
prototype of the Robo Bees made up that we gave to a couple of members of Congress and to the head of the uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy. So, um, but this was all, all of this kind of work in trying to forestall some unfortunate story is all intended to preserve our reputations, all of our reputations and how we handle federal research funding um, because it's critical. You know, if you, we also um, are involved in a lot of coalitions that involve some of the other institutions that I've represented around this room. And we do um, engage pollsters at times to test, you know, what the, um, what the public opinion is uh, of universities, of research, of our importance, of our credibility. And the fact still is, I can show you recent research from this, I'd say in the last six months, that still shows that um, in an era when there are almost no institutions that have very much credibility at all in the public, universities still do. Scientists are really high in their credibility factor with the public. Um, institutional presidents and CEOs of hospitals are really high. Put a white jacket on somebody and they're very high credibility rating if they're involved with a university or a private uh, or independent hospital. Put them in an industry setting and they're slightly um, less credible in the public side, which is interesting for us to keep in mind as we now are more increasingly working with industry. And it's important for the research, it's important for the funding, it's important for the researchers to, un to understand how their, their work can be translated and practical. But as we do that, we have to understand that, that there are issues about um, our credibility and our partnership that, that I think is the most important currency that we have. So that's a kind of rambling way to get to the work that you all do are seeking to do or are, you know, um, are expanding your awareness of how to do it is critically important to those who in your institutions or elsewhere do government relations or the senior administration who are worried right now about the availability of funds uh, from the federal government on science going forward. It is a really bleak climate right now in Washington for anybody who's relying on federal funding and, and among those kinds of institutions, universities who who are research intensive are among the most at risk. Um, there's still a lot of support. Um, I think we're in a period of time when, if you were to project, you know, what you would consider to be a success, I think if you can, if we can keep a flat funding trajectory, or maybe um, slight increases for inflationary um, increases over the course of the next three or four years, I think people would view that as successful at a time when they're talking about bipartisan interest in cutting. Uh, spending significantly. Um, so it's a question of managing that. You know, we've been meeting regularly with folks in the Republican Party, Eric Cantor, who's the majority leader in the House, um, Senator Toomey, who replaced Senator Specter from Pennsylvania in, um, in the Senate. That's a tough trade. You know, Senator Specter is a Republican champion of science. He was a person on the key committees when all these investigations go on. He was a person who would be who would provide a reasonable airing to us on, on what the facts were and provide us an honest panel to present our point of view. Patrick Toomey, is, his top priority really is um, deficit reduction, but when you met with him, he understands that in the course of doing that, everyone is an equal, and he, feel, he feels that uh, research is a very high priority. Now, but it, his top priority is still budget cutting. So uh, it's in that context that we work. So I think that my message really is that um, it's critically important for government relations folks, the people who interact with the press and with the government. And, and in my institution, we do both in the same place. So that's, I have the advantage of having, of managing both of those communication, external communications functions, which I think works really well because they should support one another. Not every institution does it that way. Um, but it's really important for you to have a relationship, I think, with, with those uh, public information officers, they're called in, in a lot of your institutions um, or your government relations folks, because that's where, um, if there are speed bumps in the road, that's where they're going to emerge, and it's how we handle them, how we can defend what we've done with solid record keeping, with rational, pro uh, with rational programs and explainable programs on how we implement federal policy, and I think that's our best defense when these inevitable issues come up. When you're managing hundreds of millions of dollars in program, and I've heard the institutions here, um, several of them are, are, have a half a million dollars of 
research a year, probably thousands of, of grants that you're administering, there's going to be problems. Um, so I think understanding that it's really important to have good protocols, defendable ones that people understand and can communicate clearly. And I think that most of you do. And I do it in my work. And I know it in my campus. My job is made so much easier by the um, by the administrators who uh, work on the grants. They fight me. Um, they, we have this group called the Sponsored Program Officers Committee that meets regularly at, at Harvard. And I'm invited to all of their meetings. And I typically give a, an update on what's going on in Washington. And one of my staff from Washington always comes up to those meetings because we then learn a whole bunch about what's going on. I remember when I used to first go to those meetings, it was like it was a different language being spoken. I spent the whole meeting sort of nodding my head like I understood what people were saying, but I was like a dog watching television, you know? <laughs> I had no idea. Now I actually understand what's going on in those meetings just by osmosis. And it's really, um, I'm proud of that growth. It makes me feel more secure in, in doing the job. And I think that if you can connect with your government relations or your public information officers in the same way, it will serve you well. Um, I wanted to mention one other area that I think is an expanded interest, in, and it's an unusual one, but, um, but it really comes out of the other uh, area that the government invested heavily in. We have the stimulus money on the one hand and the TARP money on the other, sort of the Wall Street bailout money. That has raised a tremendous amount of, um, of, of, of attention on the other kinds of our faculty who typically don't feel the conflict of interest and stuff in regulation should apply to them. They're the folks at the business schools, the law school, the economists, and the others who are commenting on different market sectors. Um, there's a huge amount of attention right now on this kind of cohort of faculty and how they're influencing public policy and how, in some instances, they're not governed by the same kind of more intense protocols we have for doctors and biomedical researchers, people who deal with patients, because that's typically the way we, um, in, in, at least in Harvard, in, in most institutions, I think that we've been intensive in our oversight of folks who deal with patients and pharmaceuticals, and, they, and their work may result in drug discovery. But folks who are in the economics world or legal world, um, who may be on boards of Google and others, and may be writing for the Wall Street Journal about opinion pieces that influence those markets, or economists who actually influence the creation of the top uh, legislation. And guess what? That's a trillion dollars of tax money at risk there. And who are these people who they represent? That's a new area of conflict of interest. And that's an area of tension on campuses because um, what is appropriate governance has always been a problem on a lot of large campuses who have a broad range of research that the kinds of protocols you might have for one area that's um, intense on uh, patient interaction and stuff, human subject type research. Do we want to encumber people who are doing other sociological studies and economic studies with the same kind of paperwork and this is a pushback and why are you burning us with all this stuff? This is who they're talking about. Well, guess what? Now they are talking about this group. And, um, and there was that documentary that I think that, that, that won the uh, Academy Award this year that has raised some additional attention on it. So I think it's something that campuses really have to keep in mind. And I know that at Harvard, it's one of the ones that we're wrestling with in developing new across the board protocols and of interest. But I'm mentioning that because this attention on relationships um, is really becoming much more intense and broad and you know, relationships. So I think with that, I'd be happy to stop and we can have a question and answer or just uh, your comments and stuff.